It's good to have you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, normally, I like to talk a little bit about the status of the ecosystem because it drives the macro picture. And um, <clears throat> then I was um, traveling through with, with Macron when he had dinner when he had this five billion announcement and then I was with my main investor Temasek in Asia at the Singapore summit where people discuss on a macro level what are their fears, what, how, what, how do they think about technology and all these impressions I had made me choose a different title, made me cho choose the title Cold War II and the role of tech. Because that's what it felt when you listen to the people in Asia. Um, <clears throat> we have two dimensions. We have an economical dimension and a political dimension if it comes to tech and, and the role. Let us quickly recap what, what, what I mean with that. So we all know there have been industries that have been totally disintermediated and have been destroyed, um, largely due to the uh, regulation or tech, as the, the Kodaks, the Thomas Cooks, or the banks. Yeah? So I have some numbers here which you need to um, still like indulge, so to say. There's a whole meme going around. Deutsche Bank, 2007 to 107, stock price to six. Commerzbank, 292 to six. Unicredit, 377 to 10. It is everything the same for the say for this sector, whereas the American banks, they did way better for two reasons. First, not every member state of a EU wants to have a single bank, so they only have four. And secondly, of course, uh, the pressure vis-a-vis -vis banks in the US is a little bit more vis-a-vis -vis foreign banks than home banks. Um, why do we constantly underestimate the threats that that come with these developments. Very quick, some of may I have seen that, but <clears throat> all these innovations happen at a logarithmic scale, and we are used to exclusively think in terms of linear progressions. That means, we, at the beginning, we constantly underestimate the effects of technology, and once the technology that normally develops in an IS curve then suddenly gets into a logarithmic scale, the industry can't cope with it anymore, and it's lost. So this has led to a lot of industries being lost in a very short period of time that you can see here. The moment the logarithmic curve kicks in, you will have between two and six years that the new technology takes 70 to 80% of a market. Yeah? As a consequence, um, our daily life is largely dependent and, and, and dominated by <clears throat> platforms that we use that have uh, or, or American origin and that will <clears throat> have a decisive role to play going forward. The second is the political dimension. And when I was looking for the reasons why there was always one specific reason that made um, the, the competitor to the old industry succeed. And the reason why these political tensions become Mainly, mainly be driven by a new popularist style is, to my interpretation, the emergence of social media. Why? Because our teenagers spend three and a half hours a day. By the time they finish education, that would have been 13,000 hours. When a working day has eight hours a day, then a 24-year-old has spent 7.1 years on social media. So meaning, the most important time when he gets values, when he gets uh, information, and this is all in the hands of application and platforms that uh, influence other teenagers in Europe but might not necessarily convey these informations with the, the same value or ethics that, that we have. So this leads to the fact that <clears throat> a lot of people are on these platforms and then, as you might have seen with Tristan Harris and his uh, nonprofit organization, then a very interesting phenomenon if it comes to political um, opinion creation kicks in. So it means that whenever you look for something in the internet, uh, on a, whereas with a very re real topic without any manipulation, you get, because it's a free model, 
the whole industry lives proposing new articles or other pieces of information on the same page that you look for it. So for YouTube, that means, for example, you wanted to look for something which would have been um, <clears throat> 12 minutes to, to be satisfied with, but the average session is an hour, so meaning 48 minutes is consecutive serving of information that was not initially uh, retrieved. So that, and, and then the fact that emotional and radical content has a 35% higher click-through rate means that this is majorly served and that way you end up automatically with more radical content and opinions. So that's <clears throat> six times faster spread of fake news or emotional and, and, and uh, populist content means that this is the way, and that's the dangerous thing, that the information and the, the opinions under the bell curve of the population is formed, and these are the end the voters that will create uh, <clears throat> the majorities in our new elections. So meaning our elections are largely driven by the composition of an algorithm that comes from everywhere but Europe. So that's the reason why you have suddenly populist leaders because with Twitter, they and direct social media, that's the first time that they have a direct way to communicate with the audience and not that there were journalists in between as a filter so that you could get the biggest um, rubbish out of it. Um, thank you very much. And God needed I be disciplined only to say rubbish. So, <clears throat> so both economy and politics have, as you can see, become largely and highly dependent on, on, on technology uh, and politics. So, and I want to put that in a context also. There was a very funny, interest, very interesting situation in Asia. When the Asian leaders of state were asked in Southeast Asia, how do you feel? They all said, hmm, yeah, look, we are to 50% dependent on the US and to 50% dependent on, on China. So if the two big guys say, either you are in my camp or in no camp, we cannot really make a decision. Uh, and when I heard that, I said, wow, well, it's not so different as it is in Europe as well. So which will put us for in, in front of a lot of problems going forward. And historically, how we have as a, in Europe been, been brought to, 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 in, to a certain direction, technology played a big role into it. Uh, <clears throat> it has been used to, as a major pressure point. Historically, in most cases, where after, world, uh, after September 11 or now with Iran, the, the fact that the uh, US controls the payment mechanisms and that the dollar clearing can only happen in the US is a, is a very, very strong argument where we can be arm twisted in a very, very efficient way. And when we think about all us here, when we go out and we go into Munich and we want to have a good time and we spend our private money, with the likelihood that 60, 70 or 80 percent, our retail payments happen on MasterCard, Visa card or American Express, which is all American backbone infrastructure. So I'm not saying per definition that it's good or bad, but we just need to make sure we know consciously in which kind of dependencies um, we run into and if we want to accept them or not. On the flip side, since there's this duopole with the uh, um, US and China, mm, China decided to introduce payment systems with QR codes. The beauty with QR codes is they sit on top of the stack, meaning if the app and the acquirer or the merchant has a QR code, you can create a payment system without ever using the credit cards. So China that way gets independent in their payment system from the um, underlying systems that all run in, uh, through US. Through US. Um, as a consequence, China has discovered that and they think that's a very important, important fact for them. 
So they keep on acquiring very, or investing very heavily into fintech companies in order to build, take that as a building block. This was an aspect of what it means, what we need to be aware of, how, tech, how we have need to drive technology in Europe, not only for, oh, it's nice to have a startup here and there and this beautiful unicorn here and there. No, no, it is, goes really into the substance of, of the continent and the autarky that we have. The other thing is, think about it as economic future, about the wealth. How do we need to think about that? What I'd, I would show here is the half-life time of the companies in the Standard & Poor's. So you can see it has gone from 30 years to now something like 15 years. That means every 15 years, uh, the, uh, the company goes out and a new company comes in that index. That, mean, that doesn't mean anything, but that 7% of the market cap is flipped every year. So for, if you take the DAX 30 and just the DAX 30 without the MDAX, that means that to keep the levels uh, the same, you need to create 65 billion of new market caps in order to have the, the index being refreshed and being uh, on a newest level competitive. And that is also the way I feel we should finally think about how, do we, how much money do we employ into the system. Uh, and um, <clears throat> the gearing for me was very interesting when I went to, to uh, Southeast Asia and looked how Southeast Asia, meaning Malaysia, Indonesia, are building the local ride-hailing, food delivery, and payment infrastructure. So basically, you have a fight between the Gojeks and the Grabs. Gojek being a fantastic company. They started it like four or five, really four or five years ago. And they have really great investors with everybody from, from Tencent to Sequoia for, to Google, whoever. They build their infrastructure with 100 million loss a month. Uh, and the competitor, uh, SoftBank and Alibaba Finance, Grab, they tried to fight against it with 250 million loss a month. Uh, so now I, I can hear some of your thoughts. Yeah, we have this WeWork, money alone doesn't make um, the world go round. <clears throat> but at the end, you have, when you go in, when you commute in, in, in Jakarta, Everywhere you have this right hailing guys with their green vests and it has become the backbone of, of this kind of, of their e economy. So if we really want to fight back, if we really want to build infrastructure, there has to be substantial money into the market. Uh, so we see this. Um, for me, it is not a little bit here or there or trying to, 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 to be too precise. For me, it is if we want to take the fight, if we want to take our independence, if we want to live not being able to be blackmailed because of technical infrastructure the <clears throat> and uh, keep our wealth, we need to rethink the way how we do this. Uh, and Macron has been said, <clears throat> um, several, mentioned several times here, he starts this. And by the end, I don't think it is uh, difficult to do. Because if you have the power of a government, you say to insurances, pension funds, guys, we need this now, make it happen. So, and it cannot be that if we saw, um, we have it in the <coughs> coalition agreement that digital needs to be supported. So, we, that, that is in contract. Uh, second, the necessity is totally clear that you <coughs> need to employ it. Thirdly, financing in digital, we get money. You, Germany gets money to invest, works 0.5%. And the EIF creates, on a very broad scale, 15% yield. So it is an arbitrage possibility where par excellence. Everybody as a private guy would do it. And Germany is, I have to, so I'm sad to say that, but refuses to act. And that's why I'm just taking the first sentence, first <laughs> the letters here, <laughs> and say, so, so. thank you very much. <laughs>